All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Amber Betts. I'm the Me Media Relations Coordinator for the Washington State Department of Agriculture. We came here today to talk about the first confirmed detections of highly pathogenic avian influenza in Washington and in Oregon. We have a few folks lined up to speak to us today, but just a few housekeeping tips first. Um, we ask that everyone stay on mute and let our speakers finish their presentations. Also, unless you are speaking, please keep your camera off to preserve the bandwidth and provide the best viewing experience. We will have time for questions at the end. Please feel free to pop your questions in the chat box at any time or use the raise hand function when we ask for questions from the press. This press conference is also being live streamed on tvw.org in Washington and on WSDA's YouTube channel. WSD staff are monitoring questions in the YouTube channel and time permitting may post some questions from YouTube viewer viewers to our panel of speakers. Our speakers are Dr. Dana Dobbs from the Washington State Department of Agriculture. She is our avian health lead and Dr. Ryan Scholes, Oregon Department State, Oregon Department of Agriculture, excuse me. Um, there will be questions, as I mentioned, um, time for questions at the end of the presentations. In addition to our speakers um, on the line, uh, we have Dr. Amber Idol. She's our Washington State veterinarian with the Washington State Department of Agriculture. We have our WSDA Emergency Management Program Specialist, Aaron Coyle. Our uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Veterinarian, Dr. Kristen Mansfield. ODFW State Wildlife Veterinarian, Dr. Colin Gillen. OHA State Public Health Veterinarian, Dr. Emilio DeBess. Uh, Frank Amadiri, Duri, uh, Washington State Department of Health. Brian Richards from USGS National Wildlife Health Center. And Chuck Matthews from Washington State Department of Ecology. Um, and I, we may have someone from the USDA here as well. Ma Maura Gibson, I believe. Um, yes, so uh, first up is Dr. Dobbs. So we'll go ahead and hand that over to you now. Uh, Dr. Dana Dobbs, our avian health lead for WSDA. Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize for leaving my camera on the whole time, but I'm really afraid to shut it off or you might not see me at all uh, having a few problems here. Uh, as you're all aware, uh, today we put out news release of the uh, first Washington State H5N1 detection in a, a backyard flock over in the Pacific County. Um, that that originally came in as a a sick bird call on our sick bird hotline which i monitored at the time and uh you know the, the long and the short of that was that the producer noticed that one day a crow flew in with some of his chickens and the next day or yeah i think it was the next day he literally described they were dropping like flies and so we sent out one of our foreign animal disease diagnosticians, Dr. Buzzwell, to assess the situation and conduct an epidemiological um, investigation, as well as to uh, take some samples for avian influenza testing at both Washington State University uh, Washington Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab, and as well as the National Veterinary Services in Ames, Iowa. Uh, both of those sets of samples did come back positive for influenza A virus, specifically H5 subtypes and H5N1. So a, a group was dispatched to go out to that location in Pacific County and those birds, it was a small flock, it was probably no more than 50 birds altogether, 
um, was depopulated today and the birds are being disposed of. So a very rapid, quick response between WSDA, USDA and associated partners, uh, which was greatly appreciated as, of course, we want to contain and eradicate this disease as soon as possible to protect, protect our commercial poultry industry, as well as some of our backyard flocks who are also you know, selling eggs and doing things like that. Um, so I know that's a very quick overview uh, of this situation as it's continuously evolving. Um, but I will stop there unless there are any other questions. Also, uh, Dr. Idle, feel free to jump in on anything I might've missed. But again, this was a small backyard flock, about 50 birds, uh, chickens, and a few turkeys. And oddly enough, on this particular disease, uh, normally turkeys are a lot more susceptible to avian influenza and they didn't seem affected at like the chickens, which is kind of odd, but uh, this virus has been acting kind of strange the whole time it's been circulating throughout the United States. So um, unfortunately, yes, now Washington is on the map for having high path avian influenza H5N1 in a backyard flock. And that's all I have right now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dobbs. Um, now, Dr. Scholes, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to leave my camera off because I'm actually out in the field just on my phone. But um, yeah, so similar to WSDA, so we are also announcing today our first case of highly pathogenic avian influenza in a backyard flock. Um, in our case, it, it also came in as a sick bird call on Tuesday morning. Um, and a, um, one of our veterinarians was dispatched to connect up with the owner. And by the time we did that, this owner was very heads up and very proactive and had actually taken the birds to the Oregon State University Veterinary Diagnostic Lab for testing um, due to her proximity to the lab as this farm is in Lynn County, Oregon. Um, the, this case started with over the last weekend, she lost three geese um, that, that exhibited neurologic and respiratory signs and then died suddenly. Um, and so she called us from with that and the, we received results back from OSU earlier this week, indicating that there was avian influenza virus. And then we received confirmation from the National Veterinary Services Laboratory yesterday that it was the H5 um, highly pathogenic avian influenza virus that we've been seeing across the country. So um, that flock, which totaled about 100 adult birds and uh, a handful of juveniles as well, was depopulated and mainly euthanized today. Um, and those are being disposed of as we speak. Um, the farm is being cleaned and disinfected and um, we've, we've been doing some surveillance around the area. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Scholes. Um, at this time, we can go ahead and open it up for questions. I wanna remind you, um, you can ask your questions in the chat box, or you can use the raise hand function. Um, please stay muted until I send you a request to unmute, and we will get started with that portion of our news conference. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have um, Mike Cerullo. I'm gonna send you a request. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, thank you so much for hosting this press conference. Um, I'm just curious, how is this disease, uh, or how is the avian influenza spread? Um, Dr. Dobbs, do you wanna take that question? Sure, uh, and and I would really be interested in having some of our fish and wildlife folks that are on this call um, give a little more background on the wildlife detections that, that we've had. Uh, but in this particular outbreak, it has been primarily introduced by wild waterfowl. 
that are migrating. And right now the birds are migrating back north. And unfortunately, sometimes they, they stop amongst our domestic flocks and it can be spread by fecal contamination, um, contaminated water, contaminated feed, direct contact, aerosols. Um, and it's been primarily related to this wild bird migra migration, which has been a little odd just due to the the strange weather that we've been experiencing because I would have hoped it would have been gone by now and we were literally holding our breath that it would pass the Pacific flyway but now unfortunately we are we are all involved and and I, I believe now unless something else has happened 34 out of the 50 United States is now involved so this is a pretty severe outbreak but yes primarily spread um, fecal aerosol direct contact, uh, and in this case, migratory waterfowl, some other types of birds. I think uh, fish and wildlife could speak to this better, but I think it was possibly 40 different types of species could be implicated in this. So um, I don't know, can somebody from fish and wildlife comment? It uh, looks like we have um, Dr. Mansfield. Are you are you on? Or or Dr. Gillen? Um, I, I can speak. This is uh, Dr. Gillen. Um, so we also have uh, Brian Richards from the National Wildlife Health Center on. He could he could speak a bit more uh, from a national perspective, but um, it. Just in in general, this um, this virus um, that it has been detected in a variety of of uh, species of wild birds um, in in all the waterfowl flyways um, uh, from the east coast to the to the Pacific flyway here now. So it's it's covering all of all of North America, and it was it was first detected back in December of of uh, twenty twenty one. Um, so it's it's been um, been here in in North America for based on our detections for for at least uh, about five five to six months. So um, most of these uh, infections um, are related um, that are related as current strain uh, in wild birds. Uh, in wild birds have been detected in in waterfowl and and other aquatic birds, including shore shorebirds and, and seabirds. Um, one of the first cases that we we saw on this continent um, in Newfoundland was in a gull that um, that possibly had mixed with uh, other uh, uh, pelagic species, but was um, was uh, in the Newfoundland area when it, it was uh, went through a wildlife rehabilitation center, basically. So. Um, but there's other other species. There's raptors. There's scavenging birds. Lots of uh, the black vultures uh, 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 along the east coast and southeast have been highly susceptible. Um, ravens, crows, um, but pretty much all all species uh, birds uh, should be considered susceptible. Um, just just some that are come in, have a higher probability of coming in contact with it, uh, based on on their relationship with. Uh, Either scavenging or wetlands that are used by uh, waterfowl and shorebirds. Um, virus is, is highly transmissible to as we, as you, we talked about with um, uh, turkeys, chickens, ducks, other poultry. Um, but it, it basically, uh, that we, we know that there's high transmission rates not only uh, among poultry and domestic birds, but also wild birds. So. It's one of the components of this strain of virus that is truly important, and and it's at, we're seeing a a few more, well, even more than a few uh, more mortalities um, in wild birds than we we've seen in the past uh, with the strains that came through uh, North America back in 2004 and five, and then again in 2014 and 15. Um, so. It's and it's basically shed it uh, through all respiratory secretions, stuff like uh, you know the saliva and feces of the birds, um, and it, it can also remain um, infective in cold and, and wet environments. 
uh, and remain infected and, and stable in water and feces, uh, depending on the temperature and humidity of the, the environment. Um, so, pre but presently humans, uh, and our, our, our human folks, uh, our human health people can, can talk a bit more about this. Uh, they appear to be at lower risk of infection, um, but uh, we, we know we've, the, the state uh, wildlife agencies have, have um, guidance out there for hunters and, and wildlife rehabilitators, falconers, and, and, and those that, that have close contact with birds on, on how to uh, uh, just maintain good biosecurity and, um, and protect not only the birds that they're handling that, that are related to wildlife or their captive wildlife, but also themselves. I'll stop there. There you go. Great, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> the next question comes from Olivia Young, KVAL. Uh, go ahead and ask your question and I will direct it to the appropriate person. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering specifically in Oregon, how likely is it that there are other cases out there and in poultry settings? I think that may be for Dr. Scholes. Yeah, I can take that question. Um, so we hope that there aren't any other cases. However, because of the way that this virus spreads um, and you know, the fact that it spreads directly from waterfowl as they're migrating through, um, you know, there that's always a risk. We're we're prepared for that. We're trying to do a lot of outreach and get our, our sick bird hotline out there um, so that, you know, anyone who may have sick or dead birds can give us a call. Um, you know, we'll call back, we'll get, get information, they'll get to talk to a vet and then um, kind of make a determination from there if there's any risk. And if there is, we'll get testing done and get that followed up on. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Scholes. Uh, next question comes from Isabel from the Chronicle, and I will go ahead and unmute. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I was wondering the best way for people with backyard flocks of their own to protect them. Um, Dr. Dobbs or Dr. Idle, do you want to take that? Yeah. Um and I'd like to echo something that uh, Dr. Scholes just said also is uh, we've been actively following up on several sick bird calls and um, constantly putting out a lot of education and outreach and in particular working with our commercial producers to be prepared to update their biosecurity plans to, to look for anything unusual and everybody's really been preparing for this for a long time and I guess preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. And so we're we're very much uh, similar to Oregon in, in our preparation efforts. And But to answer your question, backyard flock owners, the biggest thing is biosecurity. It's uh, since this can be, a, you know, birds literally flying overhead or landing amongst the flocks, it's good if you can bring them under cover if you can, or cover their coops if you can. Uh, clean up any food spills, limit visitors to the farm, especially if they're other poultry owners. And there's a lot of great resources, excellent resources on USDA's website, and it's called Defend the Flock. And on there, there's a series of biosecurity tips, videos, uh, all kinds of things. And I believe some of it's in different languages. And so uh, the other thing is, I encourage backyard flock owners to purchase only from National Poultry Improvement Plan sources and that they, those folks undergo stringent inspections, AI testing, Salmonella pylorum typhoid testing and others. So those are those are a really good place to get your new chicks from and, and some of the, uh, the feed stores that buy only from certified MPIP hatcheries. Uh, so again, I would defer to those excellent resources on USDA's Defend the Flock program. But again, just keeping things clean, keeping things clean and disinfected, limiting access uh, 
to visitors that have poultry. Don't share your equipment with other folks, things like that. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you, Dr. Dobbs. Um, next question we have coming from our YouTube channel. Um, wondering if pets uh, like cats and dogs are at risk if they get into the area where there are infected birds. Maybe Dr. Dobbs. Um, I can answer that probably. Uh it would be more probably in the in the respect of them acting as a fomite, perhaps like stepping into the contaminating environment and then going to a different coop or something of that nature. Uh, same is true for, you know, it's important to control rodents and things like that around your chicken coops uh, because they can spread diseases also. Maybe not, you know, carrying this H5N1 virus, but just tracking things around from coop to coop. Great, thank you so much. Um, the second part of that question was, what other platforms are we showing the press conference on? And that would be on TVW and also on YouTube. Um, next question comes from Jillian from the AP. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Now I'll direct it to the appropriate person. Uh, yes, hi. I was wondering what this means for people who have bird feeders in their backyard, if there's any concern about if you feed wild birds, um, can, you know, of contamination there or, or transmitting the disease further in the wild bird population through your feeder. Uh, Dr. Mansfield or Dr. Uh, Gillen? I wonder if you might have Dr. Richards answer that question. Okay. Perfect. There, unmute me. Just yep, checking we, to make sure you can, can hear, hear me. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you um, for the question regarding you know backyard feeders. Uh, the science really doesn't support that any of the avian influenza viruses, including this highly pathogenic avian influenza virus, would actually be circulating you know in in that type of backyard songbirds. Um, certainly, there's the opportunity for the pathogen, you know, a virus, you know, to spill over into what we would refer to as a dead end, literally a dead end host. And, and the literature and the, the history from 2014, 2015, and the current outbreak kind of bear that out. In 2014, 2015, in North America, there were two you know, songbirds affected. One was a black jack, black cat chickadee. The other was a European starling, and the starling was actually tested in, in a tight association with an infected poultry farm. Um, in the current outbreak um, in all of North America, I'm aware of two blue jays from Nova Scotia, and then there's numerous American crows, which are also passerines, but those are scavenging birds. So the, the exposure route um, consuming a carcass of an infected bird is a little bit different. Um, so numerous states and, and, and groups are, are proposing you know, minimally, you know, rigorous cleaning of feeders and backyard, you know, watering devices and good hygiene. If you're going to practice feeding backyard birds, makes a lot of sense virtually any time, you know, to help uh, help promote better health of those of those participants in your backyard. But with these particular viruses, as you know, Dr. Gillen, you know, alluded to, you know, the primary carriers are waterfowl and those water birds. So unless your backyard feeding situation or your backyard flock is in really tight association, you know, um, with that higher risk situation uh, of waterfowl, uh, practicing good hygiene is called for, but uh, a universal call for cessation of feeding, the science merely doesn't support it at this point in time. It, did that answer your question? Yeah, yes, it did. Thank you. It looks like we have a couple more questions um, coming in from our YouTube channel. Um, one question says, can you tell me if it could affect guinea fowl? I can take that one. Great, thank you. 
Yeah, so this is Ryan Schultz Morgan. So it, it can definitely affect guinea fowl. Um, and the, the farm that we had here in Oregon did have two guinea fowl that were beginning to become affected by it today when we um, when we did euthanize them. Thank you, Dr. Scholes. Um, next question also from our YouTube channel. Um, considering we are experiencing a cooler spring, how much longer is this likely to spread? And what are the chances that this will exceed our or meet 2015's numbers? Um, I don't know if maybe Dr. Idol or Dr. Scholes, Dr. Dobbs, anyone, Dr. Richards, awesome. I can take a stab at that. Um... The comparison between 2014, 2015, the outbreak and the current one, while it's ongoing, we can't, you know, it, it, the retrospective look will be quite interesting. Uh, but just for a few comparisons, in the 2014, 2015, we had approximately 50 million uh, domestic or you know commercial poultry that were culled, with an estimated three to four billion dollar economic impact. To date, in this one, we're a little over 37 million birds. But the, the, the time frame were a little bit earlier than we were in the 2014-2015. Now, with regard to wild birds, um, in the 2014-15 outbreak, a grand total of, of 99 wild birds uh, were confirmed in North America. As of today, we're a little over 1,100 birds in North America combined in Canada and the United States right now. So a full order of magnitude difference with regard to detections. Then we can look at other metrics like species involved. And in 2014, 2015, there were approximately 20 wild bird species. We're very close to 60 right now. Then with regard to geographic scope, when we think of that wild bird, you know, the wild birds that are covered, you know, involved in this, in 2014, 15, there was a total of 10 states and 15 counties. As of today, we're at 34 states and I believe 215 or 216 counties. So again, just those basic metrics uh, give you an idea that um, the scope, uh, the magnitude and scope of this event vastly surpasses what we saw in 2014, 2015. Um, another indicator uh, in that earlier outbreak, we really didn't see any substantial what we would refer to, refer to as wild bird mortality events where there's a lot of sick birds in a, in a single location. This time we've seen multiple uh, wild bird events, you know, a couple, you know, involving more than a thousand individual birds at, at, a, at an individual geographic location. So you put those together and you start thinking about, you know, the risk, um, you know, the risk out there for backyard flock owners and for commercial poultry. There's a lot more virus out there this time in the environment. So we can't emphasize enough that, you know, enhanced biosecurity makes a lot of sense right now. Um, certainly hard to predict the future. Um, in 2014, 2015, when this virus went north on the, on the wings of, of migratory waterfowl, once they reached their their northern terminus of their migration and moved to you know breeding uh, breeding grounds, they're much more isolated. So it takes a congregation of birds to really keep an active infection going. And so once the birds kind of secluded to their nesting grounds, that virus pretty much burned out, and it didn't come back in the fall of 2015. We could hope for that situation this year as well. But if we look for science to help inform what might what might what the what might portend for the future, we can look to the experience of Europe in in, in calendar 2021. Uh, they had um, some substantial outbreaks during the spring spring migration. Then the disease kind of waned and moved to the northern areas of wild bird migrations during the summer. But then in the fall of 2021, this virus came back in Europe with a vengeance. And if you look at the number of reports to uh, the World Organization for Animal Health or OIE in, in the fall of 2021, uh, there's a ton of events that were reported both in wild birds and uh, domestic poultry as well with some very substantial impacts on, on, on both sectors. 
So while it's impossible to us for us to predict the future precisely, we can look to the experience of, of Europe the last year. And I would suggest, um, you know, I wouldn't bet against this virus coming back on the wings of migratory waterfowl this fall. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And um, Dr. Idol, do you have something to add? Yeah, I wanna thank Dr. Richards, you're spot on. And I think that viral load in the environment is something that we can't really predict how long it's gonna be there. Hopefully it'll warm up and that'll help kind of get rid of some of that. And I've been joking around about scaring all the migrating waterfowl north to get them out of here, but we certainly continue to have a risk um, this fall when those birds migrate south again. So one of the things I wanted to mention as far as backyard flocks um, and also the comparison with 2014-15 and, and the outbreak we have now is that it was thought that in 2014-15 in those large commercial flocks in the Midwest that there were only po two point source um, infections. So that means everything else, all the other infection that was moved was moved between farms through biosecurity breaches. And so that means when we say biosecurity breaches, well, maybe the truck that picked up the mortalities from one farm moved to another farm and they carried the virus on the truck, or maybe people carried it on their food or on their person. Um, but what's happened this year, it's a little bit different where the whole genomic sequencing that's being done by NBSL is showing that a lot of these are novel, strain, novel introductions. So that's really strange. Like we're definitely missing something here with the epidemiology and how this is spreading. Because it isn't just that everybody's doing great biosecurity, there's got to be something more. And I think, you know, Dr. Richards hit pretty hard on that, that, you know, we've got more species infected, they're hanging out a really a lot longer. We have temperatures and conditions that allow for that virus to be persistent. So I think one of the things I want to mention, at least for our backyard flocks, is the biggest risk factor are flocks that have mixed species. So if you have domestic ducks and domestic geese, and you also have chickens and guinea fowl, it's really important to separate them. The other risk factor that we see commonly with these types of flocks are that they have access to a pond or a water source. And maybe it's even just a seasonal water source where the snow melts and there's a puddle there and everybody hangs out at the puddle. But it's really important right now to be vigilant and separate species and pen them separately to decrease the risk and exposure. Um, so I wanted to point that out. And we definitely want to continue to stay vigilant with this fall because when birds get together, like Dr. Richards mentioned, they're up in Alaska and they all hang out and they go on dates and those viruses reassort. We never really know what we're going to get and, and when it's going to express itself as a highly pathogenic form of the influenza um, versus one that's not. So I think we need to continue to be, you know, really thinking about biosecurity, but really thinking about what are the highest risk activities that we do and it appears with this virus in particular, it's, you know, there's some kind of contact occurring with, wa with waterfowl or contaminated environment um, infecting these flocks, which is so much different than what we've seen historically. Thank you, Dr. Idle. Uh, the next question is from Don Jenkins, uh, the Capitol Press, and he asks, are wild birds being tested in Washington and Oregon for bird flu? And if so, what are the results? Um, it sounds like maybe Dr. Mansfield and Dr. Gillen uh, might be a question for both of you. Well, I, I can go first if, if you like. Um, we, we have been testing uh, with our partners, uh, USDA APHIS uh, Wildlife Services um, and um, the um, the testing that occurred occurred earlier than now. We're, they're they're done, just finishing up with it, and um, and it was uh, conducted primarily um, with uh, hunter harvested uh, birds from from last year, uh, the, and then those that um, some of the sampling that they could conduct through um, the springtime, early spring, um, and in Oregon they they collected about I think about fifteen hundred. 1500 samples in specific areas uh, of the state um, that were places that we, we've uh, sampled in the past and and uh, help with uh, uh, basically providing a good statistical uh, sample to, to know whether or not you, you have the virus uh, in those populations at the time. 
And like I said, they, they were all negative um, when we tested. And um, this virus is, is now uh, coming from um, these uh, wintering areas back to uh, their spring summer summer areas. So they're they're coming from other areas, and and the the flyways are are not a direct line north north and south. They uh, there's some east and west that that, that uh, comes across the country uh, as part of the migrations, and and there's mixing of species uh, in a variety of habitats, and and um, it's it's relatively complex how it. How the, the birds actually move, but uh, they ultimately, uh, m many of them end up in, in uh, Canada and the can Canadian uh, uh, nesting areas, uh, as well as, as uh, parts of Washington and, and parts of, of Oregon. But um, the answer to your question is that we, we did test and uh, we, um, we did not find the virus early on. We have been testing. Um, sense with anything that is a clinical um, bird. So if, if we had any uh, geese or, or uh, waterfowl of, of any sort that um, appeared neurologic or had respiratory signs, uh, diarrhea, same thing with raptors. So we've tested uh, multiple um, bald eagles and uh, a variety of other species that just, uh, if, if we had any suspicion, we, we test. And we we do that every day actually, um, and uh, we we have not come up with a positive yet. Great, thank you. Um, and Dr. Mansfield, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll just share what we're what we're doing in Washington. Um, we do have a reporting tool on our website, uh, the WDFW website under the wildlife disease page. There's a link that we like to refer the public to report to and we monitor those reports daily for suspicious cases. Um, and when there are suspicious cases, we can follow up and get those submitted to a lab. I will say we do have a confirmed uh, case in a bald eagle from Stevens County here in Eastern Washington. And we also have uh, three or four others that are preliminary positive results um, that were sent to the Washington Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab down at WSU at their veterinary school. And we're awaiting confirmation on those three or four. So um, we have detected it in a wild bird here in Washington, and we have some suspect cases that we're waiting on additional results from. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the next question that I have here is does the owner of the Oregon backyard flock have any idea um, how the geese were infected? I think that may be Dr. Schultz. Hi, this is Liz Beals with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. I believe Dr. Schultz um, had to continue to attend to the um, farm that he's working on today, so he's um, no longer with us at this point. Um, I don't think that they uh, have identified where the source of the avian influenza came from on that farm. Great, thank you so much, Liz. Um, the next question is how big are the quarantine areas and are there any commercial poultry farms in the quarantine areas? So um, I think we may direct that to Dr. Dobbs and um, Potentially, Liz, if you have the answer. Yeah, we we don't have any commercial producers in the Pacific County uh, flock location. It's a very remote, like literally almost on the beach. Um, so that particular facility was quarantined and we are still making plans on on going forth the surveillance from here on. But as far as I know, there's no commercial producers out in that area. And what what we're finding right now is probably fairly limited flock numbers at the, at this point. And then uh, Liz, do you have any idea if, if that uh, backyard flock was anywhere near any commercial operations in Oregon? Yeah, thank you, Amber. Um, as far as we know, there are no commercial detections that are near that backyard flock. Great. 
Um, is there any sense yet of how many birds could be affected in Washington and Oregon? Um, and then what can farmers either with backyard flocks or large commercial operations do to protect their birds? Uh, Dr. Dobbs, do you want to answer that? Um, I, I don't really have any firm numbers other than the obvious prem that was depopulated today, which is around 50 birds, I'm understanding. Uh, but as far as how many birds out there might be affected, I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, mostly important is just for owners to be vigilant for any signs of respiratory disease, birds with ruffled feathers, being lethargic, um, suddenly dropping, dropping dead. Unfortunately, some are very suddenly dropping dead, but um, again, like I mentioned before, we have our sick bird hotline that people report these things to us on and we, we screen these reports and we do send out um, someone to swab or look into that situation if it's indicated. Uh, a lot of birds are, I, I just want to say a lot of the stuff that comes into sick bird report right now is um, oftentimes the birds might be dying of something completely different. So that needs to be uh, figured out either through necropsies done at Washington State University or other types of testing. But, you know, the sick bird hotline has been getting other things besides avian influenza. But I don't remember what was the second part of that question. Uh, what can backyard or large commercial operations do to protect their birds? Well, as I said earlier, we have been talking about and preparing for avian influenza for several months now. And the backyard poultry producers are required to have uh, biosecurity plans that cover a variety of areas clear down to how they source their birds, uh, how they keep rodents out of their facilities, how, you know, just it covers a whole gamut of things in there. And they are required to have that uh, to qualify for indemnity in the face of an outbreak. Uh, and should they become infected. So they have been very proactively putting together their biosecurity plans for, for quite some time and for several years, actually. Um, some of them who have free ranging birds have brought them indoors. Uh, they've been working with the organics programs to get permission to move their birds undercover because avian influenza is definitely recognized as a serious threat. Uh, and should it affect a commercial poultry producer, it can be devastating for the industry. And in some cases, these are fourth and fifth generation families that have been doing these uh, poultry production for years. So everybody's very concerned about it. Everybody's been very proactive. And the backyard flocks, again, biosecurity has been mentioned over and over now. Um, lots of good resources, again, on the USDA Defend the Flock website, uh, from videos to different resources that they can look at, but keeping things clean, limiting contact, uh, and Dr. Idle hit on some of the other things as well. So that that's it, really just remaining vigilant and, and watching for any signs of illness and reporting it, don't wait. If you see something strange, say something before it has a chance to spread somewhere else. And even if it is an avian influenza, it's better to know than to not do anything. And now suddenly you have several prams infected. Thank you, Dr. Dobbs. Um, next is a question for our health department folks. Uh, can this be spread to humans and make them ill? Um, Frank uh, Amaduri, do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. So I guess the good news in all of this um, is that the, the risk of this virus spreading to humans is actually extremely low. Um, so there's not an immediate concern for human health right now. That being said, um, I will add that there has been one human case detected in the United States this year with this outbreak in Colorado. Um, it was a person who was working directly with infected birds um, and uh, the, but this person's symptoms were very mild, um, uh, essentially fatigue, and they have been treated um, and they were isolated. Um, there have been no human cases identified anywhere else in the United States, of course, including Washington. Um, but we are monitoring for it. 
and public health officials um, are contacting people uh, who have come into contact with infected birds um, and uh, they'll be tested. So we're monitoring for it, we're looking for it. It's very unlikely that it would spread to humans, uh, but if it does, um, we'll spot it and, uh, and certainly let you know. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, and anyone from our, our Oregon Health Authority want to add to that? Hi, this is Amelia the best. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, this is uh, Emilio the best from Oregon. So um, we do track uh, cases have been exposed to avian influenza and obviously we have the ability to test uh, right away. So we are um, on top of the situation and working very closely with the Department of Agriculture just to make sure that we have all the information that we need to contact individuals and provide them with uh, testing uh, access, et cetera. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Jabez. Um, next question is, are there any bans on the import or export of live adult birds for California, Washington, or Oregon in place at this time? I'm not sure who the best would that be that would be for maybe um oh dr idol yay go ahead that's a good question we don't know yet so we're still working through some of the classifications and the oie definitions for poultry and non-poultry and then it'll be up to our trading partners how they feel about it based on the risk um, and based on how our flocks are classified so I can't say that for sure, and I don't know if anybody from USDA wanted to comment on that, but that's the best information I can give you today. I think we have um, Dr. Gibson on the line. Do you have anything to add? Good afternoon. Uh, no, I believe Dr. Idol summed it up very well. Great. Thank you so much. And I'm not, let me see here. As a follow up question to Dr. Mansfield, can you detail the species of birds in the three or four suspect cases and their locations? Yeah, sorry. Oh. A little lame on technology here. Yeah, certainly I can do that. Um, we have a sandhill crane out of Connell um, this week. Let me look at my list. Um, we have a Canada goose out of Whatcom County, and we have a snow goose out of Moses Lake at this point that were preliminary positives and are awaiting confirmation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we have about nine minutes left and I don't see any additional questions, but I'll just pause for a moment and wait to see if anybody else raises their hand or pops a question into the chat. Amber, just for ease of, of sharing, there was a question on YouTube about whether there might um, be any depopulation recommended at captive wild bird facilities like zoos. Thank you, Carla. Um, oh, yay. Okay. Do you want to you want to answer that, Dr. Gillens? Um, I, I can just just for um, we also work with Department of Ag on on zoos um, and manage it uh, together as two agencies. Um, there there are no in, in Oregon. There there are no um, we have no cases in in the zoos. Number one, and there, we have no plans to to depopulate uh, those birds. The uh, captive birds in those types of facilities are, um, because we have we have not only the Oregon Zoo, but we we have the aquarium that has birds, as well as uh, uh, other facilities like uh, wildlife safari, 
and it's a little more complex. Uh, we evaluate each case on on how they're infected and um, and and where the birds are. They they may be, um, you know, they may be depending on the facility uh, spread uh, uh, between large distances and stuff. So that would make a difference on on whether um, a facility is depopulated or a handful of birds were, would be removed or, or just affect, affected individuals. So. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and Dr. Idol. Yeah, I wanted to just mention that we, we do work closely with our zoos on prevention. And so we've been working with them for a few months to get the messaging out to bring their birds in. So they are, you know, doing some of those strategies when and where that they can. I think there is a misconception though, and I, I, I don't know if this is where the, the person who's asking the question is coming from, but just to be clear, we don't do depopulate in a zone around an infected premise. We, if we have an infected premise, then the birds on that premise will be humanely euthanized and we and then there's a surveillance zone around that depending if it's a you know if it's a commercial flock then we would have you know a control zone where we would control movement of product in and out of that area but i've heard this misconception before where people think that every premises that's in a control area or in a surveillance zone is automatically euthanized or depopulated and that is not the case it's only the infected premise. So if a zoo fell within a surveillance area, we may do additional surveillance or testing, but we certainly wouldn't require depopulation. And I'm not sure if that was the question, but just wanted to provide that point of clarity. Great, thank you so much. Uh, next question we have, oh, it looks like uh, Dr. Richards has something to add, so I'll let you go. Sure. Um, it, 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 Thomas, um, fantastic. Um, I believe in the United States, there's only two or maybe three instances oh, where Dr. birds are of zoological collection. It may just be me? that I think that um, for me, you are cutting out quite a bit. I just killed the video there. Hopefully, that's a little bit better. Oh, yeah. Crystal clear. Okay. I don't have the bandwidth apparently to carry both video and audio. Um, the responses to, you know, ha have been spot on. I believe to date in the United States, there have been um, birds in, in zoological collections in maybe two or three instances that have been affected. And, you know, many zoos and aviaries across the nation have put their birds inside and they've taken special biosecurity precautions with regard to any rare or you know um, you know rare species or those that are highly susceptible. You know, ramping up, keeping in birds inside. You know, um, employees. You know, uh, doffing and donning. You know, PPE. Uh, individual workers being responsible, taking every possible precaution. You know, to keep virus out of those really important zoological collections. Um, Earlier, there was a question I wanted to just add a little bit of a follow up. It was regarding, you know, I believe, you know, precautions with pets. Um, typically, we don't think of these this group of avian influenza viruses as having very, you know, um, high potential with regard to mammals. <clears throat> this virus is, you know, in a number of different metrics is quite a bit different. Um, you know, over the course of the last year, we've seen a couple scientific publications regarding infection with this H5N1 virus in red foxes, um, not domestic animals, but wild red foxes in Europe. And earlier this week, the province of Ontario made an announcement of the first uh, red foxes infected with this virus in North America. So the species range certainly is a little bit different. Um, and, and certainly, I guess the only precaution there um, and it makes a lot of sense, you know, don't allow, you know, household animals, domestic animals to come in contact or consume, you know, carcasses or things like dead waterfowl out on the landscape. So not that it's a tremendous risk, but this virus is behaving quite differently. And, and certainly it makes a lot of sense not to encourage the virus to do, you know, other bad things. Thank you so much. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, 
wondering whether or not poultry swaps should be canceled. Um, and then I'll, I'll let somebody answer that and then I'll ask the next one. I'm sorry, Amber, what was the question? Oh, that Amber can answer it. <laughs> I can take it if you want. So the question was regarding whether poultry swaps or exhibitions should be canceled. And that's a great question. I think at this point we have a single detection in Washington and a, and a small backyard flock. Um, we are seeing more detections in wildlife. So at this point, I would say, you know, you need to consider your risk factors. If you're going to a fair exhibition, nothing is zero risk. You have to, you know, decide how much risk you're willing to incur. I think within an exhibition or in a swap, you know, where you're doing some kind of sales, keeping birds separated, keeping species separated, thinking about things you can do to mitigate risk are is important. Um, we I just sent out an alert to our fairs this morning, along with the the news release that stated that at this point it would be up to the fairs whether they want to continue to have those exhibitions or not. We're not going to mandate that they don't. However, if we start to get a lot of detections and we see a lot of wildlife detections and we're seeing more and more backyard or commercial flocks come up positive, certainly we would impose more of a mandate to not allow for live bird sales um, or exhibitions. But at this point, we aren't ready to make that move, but we do encourage people to really think about the risk factors. And if you're going to show birds, think about the order that you show them in, maybe stagger them where you show chickens and those vulnerable species first, and then bring ducks or waterfowl into the fair for the second half so that we don't have any kind of commingling of those two species. But again, nothing zero risk, but we're just trying to reduce our risk. Wonderful. Um... Does any, anybody have anything they want to add to that? Okay, so our, our next question, and we just have, well, it's three o'clock now. Um, our last question was whether or not birds can survive, survive the virus and develop immunity, um, or is euthanasia the only option? Um, so that can be, for any, any one of our experts here, Dr. Gibson, Dr. Richards, Dr. Idol, Dr. Dobbs. I could take a stab at that. Um, so with regard to, uh, on the domestic side, you know, depopulation is pretty much a standard protocol when a facility becomes infected. And, and a couple reasons for that. Number one is to reduce the chances of the virus being spread to additional facilities. Um, the other is, you know, certainly we don't want to allow this virus to have an opportunity, you know, to, to morph into something, you know, something different. You know, viruses are constantly changing, you know, as we've seen over the past couple of years with, you know, with COVID-19. So we don't want to provide that opportunity. Um, the natural history of these viruses, though, involves, you know, they co-evolved with migratory waterfowl. And typically the viruses don't have great impacts on waterfowl. And so that's why they make such exquisite carriers. You know, they're typically not affected unless they have a you know, tremendous burden. And we are seeing some mortality amongst waterfowl. But largely, even in the wild birds, we're seeing, you know, the you know, some of the impacts in raptors, you know, those birds that are scavenging the carcasses of infected waterfowl. So it, it's really questionable that individual birds would attain the ability to uh, uh, to resist or you know survive this particular infection, especially among poultry or or raptors. Um, you know there is some conversation. Some other countries are experimenting with you know with vaccines in in domestic poultry, but there's there's not really good candidates for that yet. Seems like you know ramped up biosecurity, um, as as you know the folks from agriculture have identified, is the best measure we have right now. Strongest thing we have going is is preventative measures. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Idol, go ahead. 
Yeah, as far as the euthanasia piece, I mean, you know, avian influenza is a really nasty virus and, and these birds die very rapidly, but it would not be fun to die this way. You know, they're dying of respiratory distress. Um, so really it's, it's kind of a humane option for them. So when we're thinking about animal welfare, personally, if I was a chicken, <laughs> I might rather have a humane euthanasia than die because, you know, it is such a virulent, highly pathogenic virus that, you know, these animals are suffering. So I think that's part of it. The other part is, you know, we have trade implications with other countries. So if we choose not to depopulate, that puts us in a pickle because there's an expectation that we are trying to eradicate control and eradicate that disease. We need to be disease free and show that we have that disease free status. So we, we really need to. And then the reason that we haven't been able to employ vaccine yet is we don't really have a vaccine technology available to us yet where we can go out and vaccinate a bunch of birds and really differentiate between a vaccinated bird and an infected bird. So often vaccines will prevent death or mortality or clinical signs, but they won't prevent infection. So that makes it very, very difficult. Maybe as we get more, you know, different types of vaccine technology that would help us differentiate that easier, then we would be able to use that as a tool in our toolbox. But at this point, if we use vaccines in the United States to control avian influenza, um, that will delay our ability to trade and recover and get our status back for international trade through the, the OIE lens. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. It looks like we got through all the questions. Uh, thank you for staying a little bit beyond the hour. And a big thank you to all of our experts who came and, and gave us their expertise. And thank you to uh, the media for helping get this out, uh, get the word out to the public. And with that, we will end and hope you have a wonderful Friday. I'm going to jump in here for just one second and say we did experience some technical difficulties with